This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome everyone to the 11th Annual Big Bang Business Plan Competition. My name is Rob Ryan, this is Chris Corcoran. We are the co-presidents of this year's competition. So we have a really exciting uh, evening for you tonight, full of presentations by five amazing teams. Uh, but first, first off, a little backstory about the Big Bang competition. The Big Bang was started here at UC Davis, again, 11 years ago. And it was, it's organized every year by a committee of MBA students from the Graduate School of Management. And our goal is to reach out to budding entrepreneurs in the region and create an environment where they can learn and turn their ideas into reality. And we do that largely through the help of our sponsors. And I just want to take some time to recognize and thank them. So the gold sponsors are DLA Piper and UC Davis Center for Entrepreneurship, SMUD, Bhutan Jones, Sarda, Sacramento Angels, Online Marketing Connect, the Graduate School of Management, Sierra Energy, WavePoint Ventures, Central Valley Fund, Intel, Acres Capital, and Bank of America. So please thank me. And also, we would like to thank the individuals who are in these organizations and not in these organizations that have donated their time and energy throughout the year in teaching workshops, mentoring these teams, and judging the events as well. So I'd like to also thank those people as well. This year we've had an amazing field of teams. Uh, we're very fortunate to have, have had uh, incredible participation from throughout the UC Davis community and throughout the capital region. Um, through a rigorous uh, series of events, both educational uh, and entrepreneurial in nature, um, we, had, we were able to narrow it down from 37 teams down to the five that you'll hear tonight. Um, in addition, we, throughout this last year, uh, Big Bang has, uh, has really had the fortune to host 12, uh, 12 events, including six workshops, to help these teams really learn the skills to take these ideas and put them into action. Uh, so we are, we are proud to have them here tonight, and we're, we're thankful that all of you came to join us. Uh, before we get started, before you hear these ideas, uh, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce to you the Dean of the Graduate School of Management, uh, Stephen C. Corral. Well, good evening. Are you ready to be inspired, excited, energized? Great. Okay. Well, Big Bang is a terrific event for us uh, each year, and uh, I've been a longtime supporter of business plan competitions, and I see how they can really catalyze the, the business community. And this very much is a, a regional uh, effort. Certainly, uh, a lot of us here at UC Davis are uh, very committed to it, but also the entire Sacramento region as well. So we're delighted to, uh, to have you here with us tonight. Uh, I want to uh, welcome you on behalf of the Graduate School of Management. Uh, we're certainly uh, delighted to play a leadership role in this, but uh, we are uh, by no means the only partner here. We have a lot of other partners from other academic units here on campus, and so this really is a campus-wide effort, not just a Graduate School of Management uh, effort. And uh, I also want to thank uh, all of our students and alums business partners and Dean's Advisory Council members for being with us here tonight. So uh, as you heard a few minutes ago, the Big Bang has a history of being really a student-led activity. We're very proud of that. This shows the great uh, initiative of our students and their ingenuity and resourcefulness and their entrepreneurial skills as well in developing Big Bang. So the finalist teams that you'll hear tonight uh, will exemplify what happens when you mix cutting-edge technology, a solid business plan, and some prize money. So Big Bang is really a showcase of the, uh, the confluence of these different resources. And it's really, as I said, designed to inspire and reward innovation and entrepreneurship and contribute to the overall culture of entrepreneurship that we have here in our region. I want to especially thank uh, Chris Corcoran and Rob Ryan uh, for all the work that they've done, so let's give them a hand. 
and a special, uh, again, a special thanks to the sponsors. So uh, there's been a total of more than $20,000 in prize money and expenses given to this effort, so we're really uh, delighted with that. And I also want to just reinforce the, uh, the thank you to all our vo volunteer mentors and judges who have been very generous in giving their time in support of this year. So it takes a great deal of time, energy, and teamwork to organize this competition. And in fact, it's like running a startup company. Students have to solicit funding, market the contest, engage customers, and deliver on their promises. And, the, and there's also the, the additional resource, the $15,000 in prize money that will be awarded tonight that they have managed. So they've done a masterful job in organizing this event. So um, I'll now uh, I just want to thank you again for coming and being out tonight, and I will hand back to our leaders for the event tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, one of the most important parts of this evening uh, is your participation, and each of you can, be, uh, can take part in this by helping us choose the People's Choice Award. Um, in each of your programs, there's a ballot. Um, as you're listening to these, think about what, you, what the best idea is, which one you really think can become a, a company, and at the end, vote on that. Uh, we'll go through at the very end, collect all those, and then we'll give you the results at the very end. So with that, um, we'd like to introduce uh, our first team, FlickSense. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Flixence. Uh, Flixence licensed software technology, patented software technology, to produce video summaries for better and effective search of video content online. Now, why is this an interesting problem? Well, there's a lot of video out there. And by 2013, Cisco estimates that 90% of internet traffic is going to be video alone. And about 66% of that traffic uh, <laughs> in mobile devices. So there's a lot of video out there, and there's going to be a lot more video out there into, uh, in, in the next few years, but there's not an effective way to search for video. Now, to understand how big is this market, we have identified uh, three different segments. One of them is the stock footage uh, marketplace. So when you look at uh, films, they don't really uh, film everything they need for, to produce their own films, to produce news they buy some of the stock footage on one of those sites. So there is a marketplace where people go buy and sell their small pieces of video. And in there, finding a, the right video means uh, a better uh, uh, sales experience. Uh, we're talking about companies like uh, BBC Motion Gallery, Thought Equity, and so on. Now there's another market uh, much larger. The previous market was about $300 million in annual revenues which is the video sharing and streaming market. And we're talking about YouTube, talking about Netflix, Hulu, where people need to search information to find uh, the right movie, the right video, or a product, right? And we're talking about uh, a two billion, up to five billion uh, dollars a year in ad revenue mostly. But there's a, large, a much larger market here, which is the uh, entire market of embedded video devices and video surveillance at large. Talking about DVDs, video cameras, and so on, we're talking now about a $300 billion market. Um, I, know, I don't have a uh, uh, microphone in front of me, but I just want to uh, point out just a couple of things. Um, we're, we're a software company that, that currently has a, a way to address each one of these markets. We, the, the first market is the, the stock video uh, <coughs> footage market, and these are Software. These are video editors. These are video producers. They are searching software. Um, they're searching. I'm sorry. They're searching video for TV, for ads, for movies. At the beginning, we had that scrolling video, and I took about an hour and a half to find that video. And we have a way to find that video in minutes, maybe ten minutes. So that cuts out a lot of time on just that one small segment. The next few seconds. So, so you've all searched YouTube, and you're looking for a talking cat video. Somebody talking cat videos are out there. There's a lot. How do you know that the one talking cat video is found at the top of the list is what you want? There's no way to do that because that one image. In the embedded device market, there was a there was a big need to be able to search through a lot of video rapidly. And that gets to our, our last point, which is image extraction, which is something we're in development for. But we, first, we want to get all of you on the same place that we are in terms of uh, 
in terms of what we think about when we're thinking about search. So go ahead. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, so to understand uh, why this problem is, is lucrative, let's look at how search works right now on the web. There's a text-based search is the current model for search online. You introduce a text and the text searches for text in the documents that you find online. Right? This works great when what you're looking for is a document. Now let's look at when you're looking for images. Right now it is still text looking for text, usually descriptions extracted from the image content or provided by their own users. But here's the catch. People complete the cycle using visual search. You look at the results of your, video, uh, of your images and you immediately know if the image is the right one for you. Now, let's, what happened to video? We apply the same model. Now, we can't tell when you're looking at a single image from a video if that's the right video for you. Consider a two-minute video. There's 3,000 frames, 3,000 different images that might represent that video. There's no way that the one that is out there is gonna be the one that will show what you need. So our solution is visual search. And visual search is precisely that. We're gonna create a summary, an image, out of your video that will tell you exactly the same information that you will get when you're looking at images. So we're trying to get that experience of images that were great for you to uh, provide video search. By looking at a single image or a moving image, you should be able to tell exactly this is the video that I need. And who's gonna, be, uh, uh, who's gonna take benefit from that? Well, people at large when looking at a video, uh, videographers when go in these stock video uh, footage providers, the video archives themselves, the, on, uh, the stock uh, video uh, providers themselves, if people can search their videos faster, they will buy more of them. They will buy much faster. Uh, for companies like Netflix and YouTube, having uh, the ability to search for the video, for the video much faster means added value uh, for ads, for instance, or for subscriptions. We're looking at Netflix. If you can tell exactly, this is the movie I wanna see, you're gonna pay more for that subscription. Uh, so this is how our technology works. When you go into a search of a certain ballet sequence, you need to go through the entire sequence to know if that's the right one for you. But the, um, by the time you go through the entire video, I can show you another one that shows you exactly the same amount of information, but in a fraction of the time. You can tell exactly by now looking at that image, you can play even a little bit faster, and by the time you've seen that, you, have, you can watch 10 or 20 of those while you're still watching the first one over there. Or if you don't need any moving image, you can actually afford some, a single static image will be the one on, on the bottom. A single image will tell you exactly the content, and now you know exactly, oh yes, this is the sequence I was looking for. This is the movie, the five minute movie that I need. To make this product marketable, we have thought of a uh, three-level strategy. Uh, we, the first uh, stage of our uh, development is taking our prototype that we have right now and do a beta test. But this is a beta test that actually can produce revenue because we can license this technology already. We have a product that we can get out already uh, to people uh, for them to provide this technology in their own websites. Uh, we're talking about specialized footage providers. For example, if you go to stream sports, uh, that is a great way for them to show exactly uh, what, what, they, what they're trying to sell. Uh, so this is a beta, uh, beta test that produces uh, revenue. In our second stage, we're gonna leverage that licensing model to create a more like a partnership. And here we're talking about a partnership with uh, both technological and distribution uh, companies. So our technology can leverage a lot of the video analytics uh, technology that is out there, and we want to partner with them to provide a much better search uh, technology. Uh, the same with the distribution channels and media. Um, and finally, we're actually aiming towards a integrated, a complete content indexing solution. Our technology is just the key uh, to provide a much better video search uh, experience, and that's gonna be the last stage that uh, we envision in about four years in our development that we're gonna get there. Uh, so, so I just wanna just sort of reiterate and summarize what our actual products are just so that everybody's clear. Um, we have one product that we're ready to, to deploy now which is the, the individual summaries that you, that you saw. And there's, there's actually a, a key, a little secret inside there that makes those summaries very, very interesting and I'll tell you about that in just 
um, half a second. So our first product is, is the, the, the narrative, the software that produces the narrative, and we can, we can license that software to the, the, um, the hardware manufacturers as an, as an embedded software to produce summaries for all the terrible video that's out there that you can delete it without having to watch the entire thing. Um, we can summarize YouTube movies, we can summarize all sorts of videos, surveillance videos, lots of, lots of places that, that video is gonna need to be summarized when all that video is gonna be out there. Now, if you look closely in the last videos that, that we saw, there's something really interesting about this. The foreground elements of that video were being extracted from the background elements. And that's interesting because what happens is that allows us to take those foreground elements and catalog those and effectively do what, what would kind of like be a reverse Google image search, where we can search for the images and we can extract the text and find out what that, what, what that is. Now, that becomes really interesting because now instead of search being a text-based search looking for text associated with video, now we can do a text-based search that actually finds the content inside the video. Now that's a very interesting concept in terms of video search, considering how much data is out there. So that's something to keep in your head, and Carlos tells us we, we need a few guys for a few years, and we can do that. So go ahead, right. Carlos. All right, well, that, that was our story. Uh, finally, we want to uh, uh, show you uh, the team that is behind this. So we, uh, I'm a computer scientist. I developed the technology, taking the product out there. Uh, Daniel uh, took the, uh, the business model and, and, and cheaper as well, creating a market. And we want to thank uh, uh, people who have advised us in, in, uh, throughout this process for the Big Bang, uh, so Professor Augustine for his uh, keen advice. And he also put us in contact with uh, Mark Randall from Adobe Systems, who gave us some interesting uh, ideas and uh, good advice about uh, how this technology can be uh, taken into the market. And of course, uh, Professor Konoma from the Computer Science uh, Department, which is a co-inventor of this software. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it is my pleasure to introduce our second team, Accelerated Medical Diagnostics. Thank you very much for the invitation and for all of your efforts. My name is Paul Henderson. I'm the CEO of Accelerated Medical Diagnostics, LLC. And our goal is to develop a product that provides personalized chemotherapy for cancer patients. And we're calling this product Platin DX. It's part of actually a platform technology that I'm very excited to tell you about. An example of the problem, lung cancer treatment is lacking. 70% of patients receive no benefit from platinum-based chemotherapy, from their chemotherapy in general. Death often occurs in six to 12 months for these non-responsive patients. And so basically all they incur is terrible side effects and the health system incurs costs of up to two and a half billion dollars per year in the US alone in wasted therapy. The solution is Platin DX. This is a test that uses microdosing. It's a concept that involves giving the patient 1% of the therapeutic dose of chemotherapy prior to the initiation of their normal therapy and then measuring the, dist the distribution of that drug in the tumor in order to predict whether the patient will respond to chemotherapy. This is minimally invasive. It involves a small injection and then taking a very small biopsy sample or blood sample. It's sensitive to factors that the competitive genetic tests may miss, such as overall patient health, kidney function, and uh, pharmacokinetics, tumor vasculature, and many other factors. Importantly, it's safe. There are no side effects associated with such a small dose, even though it's toxic chemotherapy. A pharmacoeconomic analysis indicates that we can save $15,000 to $20,000 per patient in patient care if we can eliminate half of the unnecessary chemotherapy treatments that are currently given to lung cancer patients. How does it work? Well, the patient is given a microdose by IV injection. That dose distributes out through the body and into the tumor. Then we take a blood or tumor sample from which we do, we think, two, two possible tests. One is a blood test in which DNA from blood is isolated and tested for how much of the drug binds to the DNA. Remember, DNA is the target of the drug. Or we can do a tumor test where a small biopsy is taken, DNA is isolated from the tumor. Either way, we measure the drug DNA damage using accelerator mass spectrometry. This is the technology that we've developed for this test. It's the secret sauce. And basically, a sensitive tumor, we have a lot of evidence that indicates, will have a lot of drug bound to the DNA. 
The drug binds to the, the DNA, prevents cellular replication, and causes cell death. Low or no DNA damage is basically an indication of resistance to the therapy because if there's no drug bound to the DNA, the cells are not going to die. This result from the individual patient is compared to a clinical database, which we are now acquiring, to generate a score of, say, 0 to 100, which the, the physician then uses to decide whether or not to treat the patient. A 0 might indicate a resistant patient. 100 would indicate a very sensitive or, or very uh, responsive patient. And in between means an in-between value. Our market. We estimate it's $500 million in the U.S. for lung cancer alone, based on an eligibility of 130,000 cancer patients diagnosed in the U.S. that are eligible at $4,000 per test. Platinum-based chemotherapy is expected to be an important player, a dominant player in the chemotherapy market for the next 20 years. So we have a long-lasting and substantial market. The world market is estimated at three to five billion dollars when one considers other cancers besides lung cancer and other chemotherapies that are eligible for Platin DX. The competition includes a few publicly traded companies and many new entrants, including Genomic Health, who by the way has a market share of about 200 million dollars a year currently, Genzyme Genetics, Response Genetics, and others. None of their tests, importantly, measure tumor response to the actual chemotherapy agent. They measure a genetic or a protein fingerprint of the cells before they're exposed to the chemotherapy, with the exception of one company which does it outside of the body. We are in vivo, inside the body, which we believe is better. Our business model, sell microdoses and sample collection kits to hospitals, charge for assay processing in our laboratory, and then market initially through key opinion leaders, which will be participants in our multi-center clinical trial, and then ultimately expand to a broader market. Our competitive advantages in include potentially strong patent prosecution. We have patents pending. And it's the only test that takes into account, as I said, in vivo factors. So we believe the other tests may be good, but our test is better. For example, this is uh, some data from six tumor samples that were grown in, tissue dish in uh, petri dishes. We did two things to these cells. We exposed them to different concentrations of chemotherapy and determined the concentration of the drug that kills the cells. That's on this axis here. And uh, clearly, a different concentration is required to kill each different cell line. The other test was to give the cells micro doses of chemotherapy and measure the drug DNA damage. That's on this axis. And when one compares those two sets of data, you get a straight line on which the data, line, data points fall right on the line. That's essentially a perfect result. That means the microdose data predicts the sensitivity to the chemotherapy. This is a competitor assay, a, a commercially available assay that's out on the market now that's reimbursable. And we're not saying that this assay does not work, but it would not have helped these six cancer patients. This is the exact same ca six cancer cell lines. And that line should look just like the previous data if this assay works just as well. Marketing and sales strategy includes regulatory approval. We're, we're in the process of obtaining FDA approval. The way to do this then is to publish our clinical results, publish a health economic study, so basically show that the assay works, and then demonstrate to insurance companies that it's worth reimbursing, and then market to clinical oncology practice. Doctors will be our customers, essentially. Lobby for incorporation into standard of care guidelines by going to conferences and presenting to physicians and ultimately getting a recommendation of incorporation, and then educating payers, going out marketing, showing them that this works and that it will save payers money. Uh, our plan for reimbursement includes getting what's called a current procedural code, or CPT code. This is what hospitals use to track procedures and for billing. And the, there's a code that already exists called a miscellaneous code, which is, allows us to negotiate with each individual payer the value pricing for our assay. And that's as opposed to some other strategies where you have to break down each part of the procedure by cost. And this, this uh, miscellaneous code will allow us to capture, we believe, our $4,000 pricing target. The cost-benefit comparison. Well, Oncodype DX is the biggest competitor in terms of market share at $170 million in sales in 2010 alone. They're currently reimbursed at about $4,000 per test. Their health economic study indicates this saves $2,000 per patient. We believe our FDA-approved test, 
the comp competitor test is not approved, we'll, re we'll request, we, can, we believe we can justify at least $4,000 per test, and our health economic study so far indicates we can get fifteen dollars to $20,000 in savings per patient, depending on the type of follow-on chemotherapy. Our corporate progress so far, we started in mid-2008 as, as a company. Preclinical data was generated and submitted to the FDA. We now, have, uh, we now have an IND, which is FDA approval, to conduct the clinical study. We also have UC Davis IRB approval, that's institutional approval, to conduct the study. And now we've started the clinical study, and we have NCI funding to do so. Importantly, this, our data already indicate we can measure drug DNA damage in humans. This is a hugely in, in, important milestone and de-risking factor. And we have $200,000 in SBIR phase one funding, which we anticipate leading into a $2 million phase two award. A little bit of the, the uh, clinical data looks like this. This is Dr. Pan administering a microdose to the patient in one side on, in this arm in a indwelling catheter. And out of the other arm, blood samples are taken at different time points. And this has been done so far for four patients. And the DNA isolated from those blood samples, the drug DNA damage looks like this. So it increases over time, over 24 hours. And each patient has a different DNA damage profile. And our, our preliminary prediction is this patient will respond because they have a relatively large amount of DNA damage. This patient will not respond, and the others may be in between. Time will tell. We have 80, 81 patients left to go on this clinical trial. We're continuing to accrue. Our commercialization plan and funding milestones include the, the current ongoing feasibility trial, which, I, as I mentioned, is 85 patients. It'll cost $2.8 million, of which we have a $0.2 million so far. So at least we're starting. Then a pivotal trial of 300 patients, which will cost $9.7 million. That's clinical study costs as well as costs to operate the company. And that will then lead to FDA approval and construction of our CLIA certified lab. That just means a lab that's approved to handle patient samples. And then a confirmatory trial will launch in order to gain additional market share and develop new products. So uh, importantly, at each one of these points here is an opportunity to become acquired, OK? And so we can raise funding and get, and get out at, at each individual point or, or continue to raise money and, and move ahead into the next phase. Our cost and revenue timeline looks like this, relatively flat for the first three or four years as we consume funding to get our clinical trials and product launch underway. But then after the first sale, we can rapidly ramp up, break even, and by 2020, have in excess of $200 million in revenues. Note, the financial model here does not include pharma contracts. Once we demonstrate this works with an FDA-approved drug, Pharmaceutical companies are very interested in seeing if these types of approaches can be used for their drug development efforts. The team includes my uh, Dr. Chung Shan Pan, faculty member, UC Davis, practicing clinical oncologist. George Semino, former VP and co-founder of Cirrus Corporation, a publicly traded company, and a drug device combination expert. I'm also UC Davis faculty, but I currently work for the company now half time. Our SAB includes key opinion leaders for lung cancer, bladder cancer, as well as PhD level scientists who are experts in accelerator mass spectrometry. And in summary, Platin DX offers a safe way to assess whether patients will respond to chemotherapy. We have a large market already in place for cancer diagnostics, and the company's moving quickly. We have human testing in progress, a strong and growing team, and we're currently seeking angel and VC funding, and we're in discussions with Sanofi, Abbott, and others. And finally, I'd like to thank the NSF Partnership for Innovation team for supplying us with George Semino and other student help, Candace Gellner from Sacramento State University, Jamin Horn and Andrea Su, UC Davis Law students, and of course, last but not least, Dr. Pan for his tremendous help in allowing us to get this into the clinic. Thank you. Thanks very much, Accelerated Medical Diagnostics. Uh, next, we're going to hear from the team of Cardiogenics, please. All right, so my name is Scott Bishop, and this is Jenny Chang, and we're here to represent Team Cardiogenics. Thank you all for coming out tonight to support Cardiogenics and the other teams in the 2011 Big Bang Business Plan competition. So Cardiogenics is a biotechnology company focused on developing a treatment for heart enlargement that leads to heart failure using a proprietary screening platform called SmartScreen. 
So as a computer science student, I'm passionately involved in cardiogenics for personal reasons. At age 33, my cousin was diagnosed with a congenital form of heart enlargement that led to a heart transplant, which is the only treatment for late stage heart failure to date. Cardiogenics strongly believes, Cardiogenic strongly believes that it can <clears throat> use smart screen to jumpstart the development of a prescription drug-based treatment for heart failure that will ultimately save lives and increase the quality of life for millions of patients and their families. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jenny to tell you a little bit more about the problems and cardiogenic solutions. Thank you, Scott. So what's the big problem that our society faces today? Well, first, we had the major problem of heart failure disease, and secondly, the path to drug discovery is extremely difficult. So heart disease are the leading cause of death here in the United States, and roughly 5.8 million Americans suffer from heart failure. And currently, drugs on the market do not treat, uh, they only target risk factors such as high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And I should point out that all heart failure patients have some form of enlarged heart, which is termed hypertrophy. And the second problem is that heart drug failure rate is extremely high. Only one in 1,000 drugs pass through preclinical trials. Therefore, we have a huge unmet medical needs on our hand that we need to solve. So where does our company come in this picture? We provide two solutions to the problems that I just mentioned. First, our drug target is a causative factor that's linked to the enlargement of the heart and heart failure, and this has been proven in lab research. Secondly, we have a proprietary screening technology that can help us identify a better drug candidate for heart failure treatment. And as you can see in the pie chart below, that there are four major reasons as to why drug fails during development. And roughly a third of the failure is due to efficacy issue, and our smart screen technology can help us better identify our drug candidates for the future. So looking at our market, we have a huge market of 5.8 million Americans suffer from heart failure, and this number is quickly growing in this country where annually there are 400 to 700,000 patients being diagnosed with this disease, and this represents a quarter of the number that's worldwide, which is 2 million people. And so now let's take a closer look at our addressable market for cardiogenics. So we are looking at potential patients of 900 to 1.4 million heart failure patients. And the basis for our addressable market is that it is reported that 75% of patients actually have access to health insurance and take prescription medication. And based on feedback from our interview with cardiologists at Starter Health, that roughly 20 to 30% of the patients can be prescribed a small molecule treatment for heart failure if it's available. So in total, we are looking at a one potential revenue of $1.8 billion for cardiogenics once our drug reaches market. So how, what we provide as far as technology goes, we have our specialized knowledge of our drug target, that's our core competency, and we have our smart screen technology, which is our competitive advantage against other companies out there that are working in the space. And our technology is a novel screening platform that can help us identify higher quality drug candidates for this heart failure. And we're currently seeking IP protection on our technology through UCD Tech Transfer. And we'll also be filing any composition of matter and use pattern on any small molecules. And here's a proof of concept of how our technology works, is that we have these heart cells that are built in with our drug target that's fused with a green fluorescent protein, and we'll be applying our drug candidates to these heart cells prior to stimulation of a hypertrophic response, and we'll be observing what the outcome is. And on the right-hand side, where you see a change in our fluorescent protein of interest, that means our drugs do not work. And if 
the drought candidate works, then you, you should not see a response and we will be moving on these drought candidates into animal studies. So what is our competitive advantage against other companies? is that we have, as a R&D company, our core competency is that our knowledge on treating the root of the problem of heart failure by treating this protein that's the underlying cause of enlargement of the heart. And our smart screen technology is our competitive advantage against other companies. And we are also seeking a small molecule treatment through FDA and that's less risky as compared to another company, for example, BioHeart, that are currently seeking gene therapy or stem cell therapy treatments. Thank you, Jenny. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Cardiogenics' RIPCO business model, which is a common out licensing business model in small R&D focused biotechnology companies. Cardiogenics plans to seek revenues after performing animal studies on three small molecules identified with smart screen in 2013, potentially out licensing those three small molecules, as well as keep, excuse me, holding on to its most promising drug leads to move into FDA human clinical trials, potentially out licensing our lead candidate drug after phase one human clinical trials in 2014, or out licensing our lead candidate drug after 2015, 2016, after phase two clinical trials. So note here that Cardiogenics investment, uh, capital investment strategy does not assume any out licensing deals, thus any out licensing proceeds will reduce Cardiogenics need for the full dollar amount shown here. So in June of 2011, Cardiogenics is seeking $350,000 of seed capital to initiate operations and to round out our management team. And then in January of 2012, we're looking for a Series A round for $3 million to take three small molecules through animal studies in collaboration with the UC Davis Research Laboratory run by our advisory board member, Dr. Donald Beers. After animal studies complete, we're going to file any FDA investigational new drug applications and file any composition of matter patents. In June of 2013, we'll need a Series B round of $5 million to go on take our most promising lead candidate to phase one human clinical trials. And then again, we'll need a series C round of $25 million to continue on into phase two human clinical trials. So Cardiogenics financials are based on feedback from our advisory board and real world deals. So Cardiogenics expects to out license two surplus small molecules after animal studies in 2013 for $500,000 each totaling a $1 million payment with follow-on payments contingent upon that milestones paid out by the licensee in 2014 for $5 million and in 2015 for $10 million. And then Cardiogenics, again, is looking to out-license its lead candidate after completing phase one in 2014 for $7.5 million, and then additionally, or out-licensing our lead candidate drug after, phase, after completing phase 2A in, phase 2A in, in 2015 for $15 million. Cardiogenic also expects to be able to outlicense any surplus pre-animal study small molecules identified using smart screen in 2013 for, uh, excuse me, in 2014 for $500,000 each again for a total of $1 million with additional follow-on payments of $5 million. Note that Cardiogenics can expect to exit at this time either as a post-2 valuation for $355 million based on recent 2010 comparable out comparable acquisition deals. This represents a 10x return on investment for, this, for the 33 million BC dollars that were spent. So for reference, here are some comparable outlicensing deals of some candidate research drugs. Note that the average upfront payment of all these deals shown here is $57 million with an, with an average follow-on payment of a $336 million contingent upon net milestones. And note that the phase one and phase two drugs are denoted by the blue bars, and preclinical drugs are denoted by the red bars. So Cardiogenics team includes three founders and three advisory board members. We just heard from Jenny Chang, a PhD student here in the pharmacology and toxicology department, a 2011 business development fellow whose dissertation researches the basis for smart screen, and myself, Scott Bishop, a computer science PhD student and also a 2011 business development fellow. And we have our lead chemist, Silko Bodnik, 
who is a postdoc at, in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. And we have three outstanding advisory board members, Dr. Donald Beers and Dr. Heiko Wolf, who are faculty in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology here at UC Davis, and Greg McParlin, the CEO of KIPP Biotech, who has 30 years of industry experience. So Cardiogenics has identified a set of, of Cardiogenics has identified a set of compounds that are ready to be screened using smart screen. We're seeking $350,000 of seed capital to initiate operations to run smart screen to identify a set of high quality small molecules from which we'll, we'll select three of our most promising drug leads for animal studies. Thank you all for coming tonight and good luck to everybody. Thank you very much, Cardiogenics. Uh, next up, we've got Ecocatalytics. Hello, everyone. We are Ecocatalytics. My name is John Paul Farsight. I'm joined by, I'm an MBA student. I'm joined by Thomas Sydneys, a fellow MBA student, Daniel Misichak, a postdoctoral researcher in physical chemistry who originally developed the technology, and Anthony Santa Maria, a uh, PhD student in mechanical engineering who works on fuel cells. And we are Ecocatalytics. So what we do is we develop and sell catalyst material that dramatically reduces platinum use. So in a fuel cell, we reduce platinum costs by 95%. So catalysts are at the heart of many industrial processes. This includes energy generation, automotive emission control, chemical synthesis, and gas reformation, which includes the conversion of gasoline, of oil to gasoline. And platinum is the best catalyst for all these processes. But platinum is very expensive, and that is our customer's pain. So this is our customer's pain. So uh, as you can see here, platinum prices are very volatile. And they're expected to reach $2,000 per troy ounce by 2012. To put that into perspective, all the platinum in the world put into an Olympic-sized swimming pool would only get just above your ankles. That's how rare platinum is. And there's a huge market for, cat for catalysts. That global market is $20.5 billion. So that includes catalytic conversion, chemical synthesis, and gas reformation. And then there's a small sliver that's fuel cell catalyst ink. And we're going to address that small sliver first. And the reason for that are several. It's the ra most rapidly growing of those market segments. It's expected to reach $300 million by 2015. Also, our technology is a plug-in, meaning that our customers don't have to modify their existing infrastructure to use our products. In addition, it has faster sales cycles, which mean faster adoption. So how does that platinum fit into a fuel cell? So I have a fuel cell right here from our lab. You can come to me afterwards and take a look if you want. And this is, that's what you have up there. And what this is is an electrochemical device, an electrochemical device that combines hydrogen and oxygen over a special membrane to produce electricity and the byproduct water. Now I also have one of those very special membranes right here. And on it, there's a layer of, plat of catalyst ink. Here's the membrane. Membrane right there. And the catalyst ink, I have a vial from our lab right here. And what that ink is made of is a powder of carbon balls with platinum deposited on it. And our ink is much better than our competitors. Now you can see here, these are our competitors' carbon balls. They deposit bulk lumps, lumps of bulk platinum onto their carbon balls. And what we do is we take, we deposit a layer of a cheaper metal and then put a monolayer of platinum. That's a single atom thickness layer of platinum on it. What that means is 95% less platinum and the same surface area. And that surface area is what matters in the catalytic reaction. Now, the technology transfer office at UC Davis has examined our technology and has decided to put the money and resources necessary 
to uh, pursue a patent with us, and we currently have a patent application pending. And we also have testing in our lab of our ink. So that 95% I showed you before, this is how it fits in for our customers. So our membrane producer customers, it saves them 67% of the total costs of their membranes. When translated into a fuel cell, that's 25% savings over the total cost of a fuel cell. And when, with economies of scale reducing the costs of other components, and with platinum expected to rise, that increases to 35% by 2015. So to put that into perspective, a fuel cell that generates around the same amount of power as a normal car engine, we'd save $1,500. So we have an exciting product lineup. We start with the Catalyst Inc. And we move on, we expand our product line to address those additional huge extensible markets I talked about before, the catalytic conversion market. So our revenue streams, we start with the fuel cell catalyst ink, which we already have made. And we address that market through outsourced manufacturing. Then we achieve early revenues through licensing our technology to gas reformation and chemical synthesis companies. Then, after three years, we address that catalytic conversion market through outsourced manufacturing. And all of this is enabled by our core platform technology. Now, we make the Catalyst Inc. And our customers are membrane manufacturers, like this I have in my hands. Those are companies like 3M, DuPont, and Gore. And we've already been in touch with 3M They've showed interest in our technology and have given us feedback on how they'd like us to proceed with our testing. Then those membrane producers sell their membranes to fuel cell companies. Those companies include Altergy, Ballard, and Daimler, all of whom we've, we're in touch with and have had contact with. And those fuel cell companies then sell their fuel cells to companies like telecom companies that use fuel cells as backup power for their cell phone towers. Companies like Walmart and Safeway, which use fuel cells to power their forklifts in some of their distribution centers, and then also the US military. And we're basing all our estimates on these existing markets for fuel cells. Now, our marketing strategy is two-pronged. We start out with direct sales to our membrane producer customers. Then we have R&D and technical collaboration with fuel cell producers. This helps them optimize their use of our technology, causing a pull effect on our customers as they specify our ink to their membrane producer suppliers. So these are the inks available on the market today. And this is where we are. We are a new generation of catalyst ink technology. And we achieve this through monolayer deposition control and 95% platinum reduction. So how do we get there? We start by getting our own lab off campus to finalize testing and initial pilot projects, and we need $900,000 to do that. The next year, we, have, we grow our company to support multiple customers in testing and pilot process, and also uh, to pursue license agreements with chemical synthesis and gas reformation companies and we need $2 million to grow our company to that level. In the third year, we'll be involved in larger scale production, and we'll pursue that through contract manufacturing, and we'll be ramping up R&D in preparation for entering that large cat catalytic conversion market. That's the market we enter in years four and five, and we'll be cash flow positive at that point. So our market share in year five for the fuel cell catalyst ink, our core product that we have right now, will be 6.3%. That'll get us $20 million in revenues by year five. Then we'll have license and royalty revenues starting in year two and growing to $1.6 million by year five. We'll have catalytic conversion revenues starting in year four, growing to $6 million in year five. That brings us to a total of $28 million in total revenues, indicated by the blue line above, with a 52% gross margin and 36% EBITDA, indicated by the green line. 
So we are eco-catalytics. We have an exciting technology. We know what we need, and we're ready to go. Thank you. All right, thank you, eco-catalytics. Last team for tonight is going to be Zenapt. My name is Michael Howland, and I'm here today to talk to you about Zenapt, a revolutionary uh, technology for rapid detection of infectious diseases. And this technology is based on some work done here in-house at UC Davis. Uh, and what it does is it greatly reduces the cost of molecular diagnostics in a way that we hope will make these technologies much more accessible to many more people. So what is the problem? Uh, currently, infectious disease is, is a grand global challenge. Uh, over a third of the world is infected with either TB, HIV, or hepatitis. And despite advances in treatment options, early detection remains the most cost-effective way to treat this global crisis. However, uh, existing diagnostic methods are generally not accurate enough if they're cheap for early detection, or if they are accurate enough, they're not cheap enough, and that's molecular diagnostics. Uh, part of the reason that these molecular diagnostics are so expensive is that they typically require large clinical lab facilities that are well-stocked and staffed, and they also often require more than 24 hours to get a, to get a result back from that. Our technology offers the accuracy of these new molecular diagnostics, but at the price point of traditional methods. Furthermore, we can reduce that time to result down to under an hour, and I'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. So how do we do this? So it helps to understand a little bit about how conventional diagnostics work. A typical molecular diagnostic assays are based on antibody uh, sandwich assays. And in this case, they, as I mentioned, they take these large facilities and they have a lot of steps, and those steps have to be performed by skilled labor. We innovate around these limitations by making use of three core technologies microfluidics, aptamer biosensors, and cytokine detection. So first, microfluidics. What microfluidics are is exactly what they sound like. They're microscale fluid handling elements that replace the traditional plumbing of an assay. And they allow us to move the entire test onto a chip uh, that's smaller than a microscope slide. And that chip contains all of the reagents that you need. Uh, and in doing so, that serves to reduce the cost as well as the labor and aid in automation. And it also reduces the footprint that these things take up in a lab. Furthermore, it reduces the sample size required to run these assays. Our assay operates with about a pinprick of blood right now, while our competition is still using test tube size samples. So contained within our microfluidics are our aptamer biosensors. And what aptamers are are small strands of either DNA or RNA that, similar to antibodies, uh, bind to target proteins or other molecules with high affinity. However, unlike antibodies, aptamers can be synthetically produced. And in doing so, that opens up a lot more options with the chemistry. And so what we've done is taken advantage of that chemistry to craft our aptamers into beacons. And, then what, and how we've done that is by incorporating electrically active uh, moieties into those aptamers that respond directly to the presence of the analyte. So we get rid of all of those sandwich assay washing and handling steps. So and what we do with these aptamers is we detect cytokines, uh, particularly interferon gamma. And what cytokines are are specialized signaling molecules produced by cells. And interferon gamma, in particular, is produced by white blood cells in response to infectious agents. However, these white blood cells must be sensitized to these specific infectious agents, and that's what gives rise uh, to such high specificity for these assays. Uh, furthermore, an another interesting part of interferon gamma is that a pathway to market already exists. So there are currently three FDA-approved uh, so-called interferon gamma release assays, or IGRAs, on the market right now. Uh, and that's a big advantage for us when we want to move this to market. So taking our expertise in these three areas, we've put together the Zenapt Beacon uh, Diagnostic Platform, and it has a number of advantages for both the patient and then our customer, which is the administer of those, uh, of those assays. Particularly, I wanted to highlight that 40% reduction in cost we feel will really benefit both of those parties. So looking at those advantages that we have, we've identified latent tuberculosis as the ideal uh, entry point for the, to get this to market. Uh, latent tuberculosis is when you're a carrier of tuberculosis, but you're not presenting active symptoms of the disease. So the market for that, for testing for that, is about 350 million worldwide. And because it's not the active form, that market actually falls mostly in the developed world, so in, in the States as well as Europe and Japan. As I mentioned, IGRAs have already been approved for, for tuberculosis, and they, that approval, in fact, covers latent tuberculosis. What that also means is that CPT codes exist. And we, we heard a little bit about CPT codes before, They're sort of a, a, a boring uh, billing uh, unit. But what, what that means for us is that our providers can use our test as soon as we get approval for the, for the diagnostic itself. We don't have to establish a new CPT code. Uh, and for them, it means that it, they, they don't have to worry about our approval of that CPT code. 
Um, but I also wanted to highlight that our technology is not limited to TB. Uh, we've simply selected TB because we feel it's an area where our, our competitive advantages are very strong. Um, our platform is also applicable in HIV, where we have some promising preliminary data already, and we're looking at moving into hepatitis. However, we want to hold back on pushing into these markets until we've established both our brand identity as well as sales channels in latent tuberculosis. So looking specifically at our competition in latent tuberculosis, there are currently four other tests on the market, uh, but none of these tests offer the same accuracy, cost, and speed that the Zenapt platform does. And that speed, as I mentioned, is particularly attractive uh, in the area of latent tuberculosis because we can get our assay down to under about an hour. And what that means is that if the patient should receive a positive diagnosis, if they are in fact positive for latent tuberculosis, they can begin the recommended nine-month prophylactic antibiotic treatment in that same visit. And that means that they don't go back out into the world and uh, potentially spread that disease. And it also means a lower overhead for our direct customers, as the, the hospital now can treat that patient with one visit instead of two. So our, our plan to generate revenue is to sell our diagnostic kits, of course, uh, and along with those, we sell diagnostic readers. Uh, and we have designed two different reader types, a single chip reader designed for uh, on-demand running of single, chi uh, single assays at a time, marketed to clinics, hospitals, and point of care users, and then a larger, more parallel, high-throughput reader marketed to large diagnostics companies, such as Quest and LabCorp, uh, to fit in with their business model there. And both of these readers make use of the same disposable chip that contains all of the reagents necessary and just has an inlet port for the blood sample. Uh, and sales of these chips will drive our reoccurring revenue stream after sales of readers have slowed. Uh, as far as intellectual property goes, as I mentioned, uh, this is based on some technology developed in-house here at UC Davis. We currently have a provisional patent in place, and we've been in very active discussions with Tech Transfer as to how to best protect ourselves going forward. So looking a bit at our financials, uh, we expect to break even in year three, and how we get there is uh, right now we're in a developmental phase and we need some funding to get us through this first year uh, to get us to a commercial launch in the second quarter of year two, at which point we'll actually seek a bit more funding even though we're generating revenue to help drive our technology into new markets as well as to scale up to full production. Uh, and that gets us to break even in year three. And following the projections we have here, that, that puts us at about a 1% market share, which would be sales of 65 readers and the accompanying assay chips for that. Uh, and just the latent tuberculosis IGRA market alone. And that would grow, we expect that to grow at least to about a 10% market share by year four uh, before moving into those other diseases. Uh, so practically, what we need to do that, uh, currently we have a, a fully functioning lab prototype. Uh, we can run these assays in the lab, but we need to scale that up to a commercially viable prototype. Uh, once we have that, we'll move to clinically validate our assay. Uh, and once it's been clinically validated, we'll push for FDA approval. Uh, Pending FDA approval, we'll commercially launch into TB, and when that happens, we'll retool our R&D pipeline to, uh, to begin development on that HIV chip while we scale up to full-scale production for tuberculosis. So a bit, of, a bit of note on the funds that we need to do that. Uh, we're currently seeking seed funding of about $550,000 to cover all of those, uh, those first-year processes, including our patent and regulatory filings, and that'll get us to that commercial launch. Uh, after commercial launch, or at commercial launch even, we'll be looking for a, a Series A round of somewhere around $2 million to help us push into those other diseases as well as scale up to our full production and become cash flow positive. We have an excellent core team and advisory board assembled. Uh, myself, Timothy Qual, and Julia Choi uh, provide the scientific driving force, and Brian Eller has, uh, has been brought on board to help us out with the IP and legal issues. Uh, we also have an amazing advisory board that includes uh, the inventor of the technology, Professor Alex Revson here in biomedical engineering, as well as some leaders from the Sacramento area entrepreneurial community, uh, including Greg, who's here tonight, as well as Barry and Maurice. Uh, and they cover a range of areas, including management hires, uh, clinical issues, as well as regulatory affairs. So in summary, Zenapt has an amazing uh, diagnostic platform that's based on innovative microfluidics and aptamer biosensors that offers uh, significant advantages over current antibody-based molecular diagnostics. We've identified the latent tuberculosis market as the ideal entry point, and in that market, we can uh, affect the cost savings per assay of about 40% uh, over the methods available today. We have a successful proof of concept uh, working in the lab right this minute, and we have an excellent team assembled, uh, and I'd just like to thank you for your attention today. Please join me in giving all five teams another round of applause.
So as I mentioned earlier, this is the time for you guys to now get involved. Uh, you've heard all five teams, uh, and, th and this is the time to vote for who you think is, is, the, uh, is the winner for the, uh, the People's Choice Award. So uh, each of you have a, a ballot in your program. Looks something like this. Uh, and uh, so f fill that out, uh, pass them out to the aisles. Uh, we have the Big Bang Organizing Committee out there uh, collecting them, and we will get, uh, get those tallied here and get you the results shortly. Uh, but before we get to the results, I want to introduce uh, somebody who really helped found Big Bang and has been absolutely essential to our, our success over the last few years, Professor Andrew Hargadon. I want to thank uh, the Big Bang Organizing Committee again. I really do think uh, every year this gets better and better, and I've certainly enjoyed this year's. Uh, I want to start with a, a little bit of the punchline, which is essentially anybody who has been involved in our entrepreneurship programs <laughs> immediately learns the first and probably last lesson that we stress, which is it's all about the network. It's all about the people you pull together and the people who come around to help you. And, uh, and the best we can be doing is facilitating the building of that network around your ideas. Uh, the Big Bang is a great program. It's also one of a set of programs that the people who are participating tonight were involved in. And I think it's important to recognize all of the folks that get involved in all of these programs, um, for those who have been here, to, to acknowledge them, and for those who may find it interesting and appealing to try next couple years uh, to see the, the, the variety of programs that are getting involved in. In addition to the Big Bang, we have the Entrepreneurship Academies, the one week, uh, essentially, boot camps in which researchers in the sciences and engineering come together and for a week, working under mentors from industry, explore and develop the commercial potential of their work. Uh, we have the Business Development Fellows Program, where science and engineering PhDs and postdocs come over to the business school for a year and spend time learning how to interact, learning how to think about the commercial and particularly the business side of their technologies. The Angels on Campus program, a recent program which has turned out to be terrific in its very first year, which brings uh, research faculty, postdocs, and students presenting their ideas in front of a group of angels, primarily led by our partners, the Sacramento Angels, who give them valuable feedback and mentoring very early on in their process, in their thought process, which ultimately often leads to our, our uh, additional program, the, the Chairperson on Campus program which is really about finding mentors that can help guide these student teams as they develop uh, throughout the year. So I want to say that if it's about the network, one of the wonderful things to see tonight was just how much the network came together in supporting everybody who was here. Uh, I want, obviously, I think uh, uh, Paul Henderson and his work um, came through with the, the, we got to work with him at the University of California Entrepreneurship Academy and the Angels on Campus, Carlos with the academies and with the network that was built uh, through Adobe. Uh, Jenny and Scott, terrific in the BD Fellows Program. Same with Daniel and Tomas. And I think it's just, uh, with all of the groups, it's just wonderful to see how each of them has sort of taken advantage of all of the support that is on campus to help them move their ideas forward. So I've been the faculty advisor for the Big Bang for 10 of the last 11 years. And I, and I truly wish I could bring you back to those first couple years. In fact, I, I know there are some people in the room who've been there, too, with me uh, in those first couple of years. And you would see the level of quality and how much it has grown. Nowadays, we actually look at companies who are seriously in need of funding and seriously being considered for funding. Uh, this is a step towards what a $700 million research campus uh, has an enormous potential to open up. I think it's very exciting to see that. And I think uh, of these companies that are here, I, we're really looking forward to seeing them as they move forward. I want to point out, though, um, one of the things that is a, as a misconception about programs like the Big Bang. The Big Bang seems like it's a wonderful after-school program, the kind of thing that MBA students, you know, we put out there for MBA students to keep them off the streets. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do want to stress that you know, programs like that, you know, while they seem like they're something that are done outside of your coursework or for the, for the scientists and engineers outside of your research, I want to say, uh, in, as bluntly as possible, nothing could be further from the truth. Think about the economy today. We're in probably the deepest recession, the longest recession since the Depression. Globalization is happening at the same time, meaning most large companies, while they're laying off workers in the US, 
are hiring them back again outside the U.S. The job market is bleak, but not to worry because if you do get a job, job security is almost as bleak. And it's not necessarily because of simply the, the U.S. market. The fact of the matter is uh, the world is producing more PhDs now than the U.S. China, India, Japan, and Germany. The world is, is producing more MBAs now than ever before. And there's simply good people everywhere. People with the right skills, the right solid hard skills. And that's why the experiences that the teams who are participating in the Big Bang and these other programs, the experiences that they're getting, the lessons they're learning, are probably going to be the most valuable lessons they will learn while they're on this campus. Why is that? Well, there's a wonderful statistic that suggests by the time you finish college, you will have taken over 2,600 tests, quizzes, and exams. And that's emblematic of the fact that most of the learning you will do in your classrooms is learning that makes you good at taking tests. It's learning that trains you to be good reactive thinkers, to know the right answer when somebody presents you with a problem. What it doesn't teach you is how to define the problem. How to look at an uncertain situation and decide this is the problem that's truly there and needs to be solved. It doesn't tell you how to design valuable solutions to those problems. It doesn't teach you how to pull together a team to make that solution move from an idea to a reality. And it doesn't show you how to create something new and valuable rather than simply moving ideas around, moving money around. Joseph Schumpter, the economist, the German economist, essentially said, and I paraphrase only slightly, the entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial venture consists primarily in getting things done. In fact, this is one of the few times that you'll, you'll get a German economist to say something quite so bluntly. But he said very simply, entrepreneurship is about getting things done. The teams that presented tonight and those who participated throughout the year learned what it took to identify the problems, develop valuable solutions for them, pull together teams that didn't exist before, create something new and valuable that has the potential to move on and give lots of other people value as well, and to get it done. Those are the skills of the new economy. Those are the skills of the jobs that will stay in the US. Those are the skills that will get you those jobs. And those are the skills that will make you successful in those jobs. I think it's important to point that out, not to scare anybody, but simply to suggest to everybody that being good at taking tests, being good at showing up in class, aren't going to be the valuable skills that will move the economy forward. If you look, you know, if you look below the surface, they, they never really have been. But in this particular case, it's no, it's no longer beneath the surface. It's on the surface. If you want to survive in today's economies, you need to be entrepreneurial inside large companies, in small companies, and those are going to be the skills we have. And I'm wonderfully, I mean, I'm delighted to see that the Big Bang, like the other programs, is really bringing that out and allowing students to participate and get the experiences in exactly these. So I want to thank uh, all of you for, for, for showing up tonight. I want to thank all of the teams for participating in the program. I want to again say how wonderful the, the competition is. And having been kept uh, in the dark about who won, I want to say that I have no idea uh, because, in fact, looking at all of the competition, all, all of the teams, it's wonderful to see that I have no idea. And say thank you. Join us next year for the Big Bang competition. Join us also for the Entrepreneurship Academies in green technology, food and health, biomedical, and, uh, and then a generic uh, UC version. And join our BD Fellows program. If you're from the engineering and sciences, come on over and learn what it's like to work in the, in the commercial world. And with that, I want to thank you and all, and uh, have a good night. And I'll turn it back over to our, our uh, committee. All right. The moment you all have been waiting for, uh, our, our presentation of, of, our, of the big checks. Uh, as, uh, just to echo, uh, we want to thank everybody who's participated in this. It's been an amazing, uh, amazing run, and uh, we are thrilled that we have five great teams and uh, a few that are going to receive some prizes here tonight. So, 
Without further ado, uh, I'd like to announce the winner of our People's Choice Award. Uh, that award for $2,000 goes to EcoCatalytics. This is truly exciting. Uh, so for second place, and again, this was, um, these teams presented in front of judges many, many times. And uh, these judges came from, again, these sponsors, so we'd like to thank them again. And um, second place gets, gets a whole $3,000, which is very substantial in uh, accomplishing the dreams and, and moving forward for these teams. And again, um, we'd like to thank all the teams, but uh, second place goes to Eco Catalytics again. All right, the grand prize, the $10,000 prize for the 2011 Big Bang. Uh, the winners of this year's competition are Accelerated Medical Diagnostics. that's it for tonight. Um, we want to thank you all for coming. Um, as you guys have seen, it's possible to win. We have, you have your contemporaries. You had your students here, uh, other students. So next year, join this. Take up, take up the business plan. Come, come to our workshops. It's your chance to succeed. Uh, we want you to be part of this, and we want you to, uh, to succeed. So thank you so much for your participation. We look forward to seeing you next year.